Welcome to The Analytic Christian. I'm Jordan, and this is the channel that helps you explore Christian philosophy and theology. I'm really excited to have Dr. Linda Zegzepski with me. Hello, Dr. Zegzepski. Hello. Um, she is a, well, yeah, she is Professor Emerita at the University of Oklahoma, correct? Yes. Yeah, and, uh, a very influential philosopher, so I'm really privileged to have her on. And uh, she's written a few papers now on omnisubjectivity and is currently writing a book on the topic. So that's what we'll be discussing tonight. Um, let me ask you first, how did you get interested in this topic? I'm not sure how to answer that because most of the time ideas just come to me sometimes in my sleep. I don't know. It, so I don't, I don't have any memory of when I first had the idea, but I did find it very comforting and um, I'm not sure what the word would be. Um, I like the idea of God always being present in my mind, knowing what I'm going through, whatever it is, good or bad. Um, sharing my life, I guess, in the most intimate way. But I don't know that that's an answer to your question because I don't actually remember what gave me the idea at the beginning. Yeah. Well, that's that's still a good segue. So let's begin. This this attribute that we're going to be talking about is omnisubjectivity. But first, mm -hmm. let's get clear on some terms. So what is subjectivity? Well, what I mean by subjectivity is consciousness as it is experienced by a subject. Um, often we say it's consciousness from the first person point of view, not consciousness as an object. I mean, we can treat consciousness and even our own consciousness as an object. We can treat consciousness as an object when we discuss it metaphysically, like we're doing now. Uh, we There can be empirical investigations of consciousness. Recently, there's a lot of um, work in psychology on empathy. That would be an example of treating a conscious state as an object. And we treat our own conscious states as objects. Um, we do that to judge them and to, well, to govern ourselves. So if I say my feeling yesterday when the airline kept me uh, on hold for an hour and 15 minutes after knocking me off their website, uh, that feeling was maybe more extreme than it really had to be. <laughs> yeah. So I can, um, you know, I can make make my own judgments about a mental state. Uh, and when I do that, I'm treating my conscious state as an object. So we do treat our conscious states as objects all the time. But what I mean by subjectivity is is conscious states as you experience it, the way it is when you experience it. Um, and so and that's why, you know, people say the first person viewpoint to try and convey the idea that it's your conscious state from within your own head. Yeah, that's helpful. All right, now then, what is om omnisubjectivity? Well, I made up this term omnisubjectivity to mean um, a complete and total uh, grasp of the subjective states of all beings who have subjective states from their subjective put the point of view of the subject from their first person point of view. And uh, my argument was that God must have this attribute of omnisubjectivity. Okay. So God has a grasp of the subjective state. States of all beings who have subjective states. And I'm kind of vague about, you know, I mean, I don't know how many beings have subjective states. There are surely many animals who have, consciousness, um, whether consciousness has to reach a certain degree of complexity before the animal has what we would call subjective states. I'm not sure what to say about that. Mm -hmm. um, I often use the term the self to mean the bearer of subjectivity. And, you know, so you might think, well, if there are animals who are conscious, but they're only barely conscious and they don't have a sense of self, do they have subjectivity? I'm not sure the answer to that question. But clearly there's a lot of subjectivity in the universe. Humans are not the only ones who have it. Um, and um, so my argument would apply to any of those beings, whoever mm -hmm. it is, whatever, you know, whoever has subjectivity would come under the heading of, um, you know, what an omnisubjective God would grasp. 
Yes. Yeah, I made, I don't know if you saw this or not, but I made the title of the interview, Does God Know What It's Like to Be a Bat? So yes. if a bat has a sense of self uh, or subjectivity, then the answer would be yes. And Yes, and I don't, I don't, I think that we use the term self in a little bit too high flown a sense, you know, where it, it, the bat probably has subjectivity and may not have a full blown sense of self, but um, that doesn't matter for my point. As long as the bat has subjective states, then God would, would need to grasp them. Yeah. Okay. Now in the paper that you shared with me, which did that come from what you've written for this book that, that you're doing? I'm not sure what I sent you. What did it I was send the longest you? one you've done. I don't know. Oh, okay. So um, what I sent you is coming out in my collection of philosophy of religion papers that Oxford's publishing this spring. And it's, it's mostly the same as the Aquinas lecture, but I added a section on the Trinity hmm. uh, from the last of the three papers and uh, so it just combines the, the papers in a sense. It, there are some uh, modifications, but not major ones. Um, the book I'm writing will be much longer. There'll be a lot more in it. And hopefully some of that will come out in our discussion. Yeah. Well, I just mentioned that because what I'm drawing on comes from, from that paper. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. So in that paper, you argue that omniscience entails omnisubjectivity. So can you walk us through that argument? Yeah. So if you think that omniscience is knowing everything, then an obvious question is, what is everything? And I want to say that subjectivity is something. And a being who only knows all the objective facts doesn't know everything there is. So if God knows everything, God must be able to grasp your subjective states as they are when you experience them, not simply objective facts about your conscious states. Um, so that's sort of in a nutshell what the argument is. Um, in the book, I actually have quotations from, from the Hebrew scriptures and Christian scriptures and the, and the Quran and uh, even some things from the Hindu Upanishads to show that the idea, uh, the connection between being all-knowing and being omnisubjective is actually, I think you can find that in other religions besides the Christian religion. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. If you just define omniscience as a being that, that knows, knows everything. Knows everything. Yeah. Yeah. Then um, now that definition focuses on knowledge, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, knowing everything. But if I'm, if I'm correct about this, and we can get into the objection here. Uh, so some philosophers have tried to argue against what you just said and say, no, 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 omniscience doesn't entail omnisubjectivity. Um, can you first give the reason why they say that and then your response? Yes. Well, the reason I'm, I'm aware of is that just, traditionally, omniscience, at least in, in recent philosophy, you know, this century, the last century, has been defined as knowing the truth value of all propositions. So as long as God knows the truth value of all propositions, God is omniscient, whether or not he grasps your subjectivity. And uh, I want to say, look, I don't want to argue about the definition of omniscience. Just suppose you're right that omniscience just is knowing the truth value of all propositions. Um, there's still something such a being doesn't grasp. A, a, a being who does not, is not able to tell the difference between the subjective state of Mary in uh, Frank Jackson's famous story, where Mary is in a black and white room, uh, never sees anything in color, while she's in that room, but knows all about color. She knows all the true propositions about color and color perception, including her own color perception. And then when she leaves the room, she sees in color for the first time. 
Now, what I want to say is it doesn't matter whether she learns the truth value of a new proposition when she leaves the room. The, the main point is that she is in a different state than she was in before, a different subjective state. She can tell the difference. And when she leaves her room, she will exclaim, you know, she'll be sure everybody knows there's a difference. She will be amazed at what color looks like. Um, and if she can tell the difference, God should be able to tell the difference also. In other words, if there's a difference between the conscious state that Mary's in before she leaves the room and after she leaves the room, God, as the creator of everything, ought to be able to tell the difference in those two parts of his creation, the subjective state before and after she leaves the room. So my point is, it doesn't matter how you define omniscience. It's a matter of being able to distinguish one part of the creation from another part of the creation. And if Mary is in one kind of a state before she leaves the room and a different state after she leaves the room, God should be able to tell what the difference is, mm -hmm. uh, whether or not that's a propositional difference. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I know in the paper you say defining omniscience that way just pushes the problem back a step. And we can talk, we, we, we can think about just a cognitively perfect being and surely right, what Mary's right, experiencing right. is cognitive. <laughs> um, so whether you count it as knowledge or not, whether she knows something new or not, that doesn't matter. Clearly something cognitive is going on and a cognitively perfect being uh, can grasp that difference. Yes. Or, or just to kind of back up to what I was saying, um, a cognitively perfect being should be able to tell the difference between one part of the creation and another. And um, it should be able to distinguish what's going on in Mary's mind when she sees in black and white from what's going on in Mary's mind when she sees in color. Um, so it's a matter of being able to distinguish features of his own creation. And that is what you would expect a cognitively perfect being to be able to do. Yeah. Okay. So let's turn now to a second argument that you give for omnisubjectivity. This one, uh, you start with omnipresence and you say omnipresence entails omnisubjectivity. So how does this argument work? Well, omnipresence is the property of being everywhere. And um, this has always raised the question of how can a God who's not in space, has no body, does not take up any space, be everywhere? If everywhere is a word that sounds like it means in all points of space. Um, and the answer to that, that you find traditionally, is that being everywhere means being imminent in every part of the creation. Uh, it doesn't mean being in space the way a cup is in the cupboard. God is not in creation the way a cup is in the cupboard, but God is present to every part of the creation, whether it's a spatial part or a non-spatial part. So whatever, you know, the, the argument that God must be in every you know, every spatial part of the creation um, applies to the non-spatial part of the creation because omnipresent just means imminent in everything. Um, and so if that's right, then it would seem to follow immediately that God must be present in your mind when you're having your conscious experiences. And so must be able to, um, you know, is, is imminent in those experiences as you're having them. Okay. Yeah. So whether the mind, it doesn't matter whether you're physicalist, dualist, whatever, mm -hmm. um, whether your mind is spatial or non-spatial, if God is present in space, present outside of space, whatever, uh, then he would be present in your mind, no matter what. That's what I'm saying. Because people who think, I mean, very few, if any people think God is actually 
a spatial being who takes up space in your room. So if God's in your room with you, it's not as if God's taking up some space in your room. Um, so the sense in which God is in your room applies just as much to being in your mind. That's what I'm saying, because it doesn't have anything to do with taking up space. Mm -hmm. So does his being present in your mind help me make that connection? If he's present in your mind, how does that, because the way we've defined omnisubjectivity um, is this grasp of the first person experience. Yes. Right. So if he's present while you're ha while you're having a first person experience and this experience is happening in your mind and he's present in your mind, mm -hmm. I guess, is that the connection he's, you're yeah, having this so experience? That, I mean, the, the, the problem of course is going to be trying to get this to make sense. Exactly. How does this work? Um, so sometimes we'll talk about seeing through somebody's eyes, you know, it's as if you're in their head, looking out of their eyes with them. Um, it's kind of like that. Um, the analogy of seeing through someone's eyes uh, is not that hard with vision uh, or hearing through their ears, I suppose, is not too hard. It's much harder when we talk about, you know, being with them in their feelings, you know, like feeling, well, what is it exactly that's going on when God is grasping in your head what your feeling of pain is like? So we'll we'll get to that in a minute, like what the models could be. But it the idea of omnisubjectivity does suggest being very close to you in your mind when you're having mm -hmm. your experiences. I suppose the definition of it doesn't necessarily imply that. And one of the um, models I'm going to suggest doesn't actually require that God be, um, you know, literally in your mind. Uh, but the but the idea of omnisubjectivity, the way most people think of it, is a very is a closeness because it's a sharing of your conscious experience with God. And then of course that also can lead to a sharing that goes the other way, you know, a mutual sharing. Mm -hmm. um, um, anyway, that's does that okay. answer? Yeah, your that's question? helpful. Okay, now one more uh, one more argument for omnisubjectivity. This one's based on prayer. So, mm -hmm. uh, how does this work? Okay, so this is not an argument that some attribute of God entails omnisubjectivity. It's it's an argument that we treat God as if He were omnisubjective in our practices of prayer. So the question is, does God hear prayers? Um, of course, we say here is if God's sort of listening to you. Um, and that's just, you know, a metaphor that we use for being aware of our prayer. Um, I don't think people, um, uh, I think people do think that God hears the prayers, is aware of the prayers. Um, and I also think that people don't think they have to pray out loud to make sure God hears them and shout or something like that. Um, they, I think they think that God hears the prayers, even if they're unspoken. And um, in fact, it's not even necessary that there be words. There could be images as in uh, uh, meditations in the rosary or um, meditations on the passion. Um, they may not be words. They're, they're, they're meditations on images and um, in fact, the meditations are in images and feelings. Um, the feelings could be meditations on the feelings of Jesus. They could be simply feelings that are elicited by the person who's praying. Um, but th the point is that you, I think we assume that whatever is going on in our mind when we're praying, whether it's in words or not, is something God is aware of. Um, and that that awareness extends to the um, maybe the degree of conviction 
that the person has when they're praying, the degree of their, you know, the degree of conviction of their faith, or um, if they're suffering, because the prayer might be about suffering, um, that God would be aware of the suffering that's going on that's led them to pray. So um, this argument doesn't prove that God's omnisubjective. It's simply an argument that um, I think that that God, that, that people who pray treat prayer as something in which God would have to be omnisubjective in order to hear the prayer. That's not quite right because God wouldn't have to be aware of the conscious states of animals. I, I mean, assuming that animals don't pray. Um, so uh, I, God wouldn't have to be aware of the consciousness of animals on this argument. But if God's aware of the consciousness of humans, when they pray, God must have been aware of the consciousness of humans before they prayed, because prayer isn't sort of like ringing a bell, like pay attention to me. We, presumably it was all, you know, God was already aware. And if God can be aware of that, then it's but a small step to saying God would be, could be aware or would be aware of what's going on in an animal's mind as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think when it comes to this one, I can definitely see that an omni subjective God would be aware of your prayers, whether there's words spoken aloud, whether they're spoken just in your mind, whether there are no words at all. I can totally see that. It also seems like, and I know this is why you said this argument doesn't strictly entail mm -hmm. omnisubjectivity. It seems like if you stick with the standard definition of omniscience, where God just believes all the truths and doesn't believe any of the falsehoods, um, it would be true this prop there there would be a proposition that um, Jordan is praying blah 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 right now, and God would believe that because that is true. Um, so it seems like he, whether the words are spoken or not, it is true that I'm praying such and such right now, and God would believe that I'm praying that. Um, so he would know that. So I guess that's where I'm like this argument doesn't right now anyway doesn't seem to like move me really any closer to omnisubjectivity. Well, let me, let me ask you this. Um, when you said God would know Jordan is praying that, what is the, mm -hmm. that there might not be any that, I mean, there you're in a state. Or it might be like Jordan is having an, say I'm meditating on Jesus's yeah. death. So mm -hmm. I have, a, I don't have any words. I'm just like picturing Jesus on the cross. Mm -hmm. So it's like Jordan is picturing or having an image of, Mm -hmm. Jesus crucified right now. Mm -hmm. And that would be true. So he would believe that would that. be true, but that's not all that's going on in your mind. I mean, you're not just looking at a picture in your mind, right? I mean, you have feelings about it. Um, you um, may, oh, I don't know, you might make a resolution about it. I mean, there's lots of things could go on. Um, and it just seems to me that God has to be aware of all of that stuff going on in your head. And I, my suggestion is that's just not captured by a list of facts about you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would be having all these feelings too. And mm -hmm. yeah, I, I see that it, it would be like, Oh, it's true that Jordan is feeling great, maybe guilt for a sin or something like that in light of Christ's death or something like that. But just merely saying Jordan is feeling guilt. That yeah, that's true, but it's like, but God, are you with me in that experience? Are you is there well, a kind of are you so, having any feelings in response to my feelings? Yes, and there's something else I I didn't say about why I think that grasping all the objective facts, all the facts that can be expressed in a propositional form is not enough to grasp everything there is. And that's that language um simply doesn't cover everything. Uh, there, there aren't words for everything, and the words themselves are way too vague for many feelings, especially feelings. Um, but when you said, um, um, what did you just say? Go, uh, Jordan feels guilt? Was that A it? great sense of guilt, yeah. A great sense of guilt. Okay. Well, I mean, 
the word guilt covers an enormous range of human conscious states. They're partly affective, partly cognitive. And, you know, the word is just too crude to actually express what's going on in your mind. Um, so I think that part of the reason I think that subjectivity far surpasses anything that can be expressed in propositional form is just that language, no matter how powerful it is. English is an extremely powerful language, has a huge vocabulary, but it just doesn't cover everything. There are just too many, many emotions that have no words. And even when there is a word like, like guilt, it just doesn't, it isn't specific enough to capture what is actually going on in your head. Mm -hmm. Okay. So those are three arguments for omnisubjectivity. One was from omniscience, one was from omnipresence, and then this one was from prayer. Now we want to think about how this actually works. How is it that God has this omni, how, how is it that God can be omnisubjective? Mm -hmm. And you have some models, a few models for this, not just one, but, um, and so you can expand on all three if you want. Right. So um, one thing I want to say as a disclaimer right off is that whenever you have more than one model, you know that that's a bad sign. It means you're not happy about any of them. <laughs> so um, and the reason I do have three is that none of them seem perfect. Um, and the other re another reason I have more than one is that that models appeal to people with different theological persuasions. So, um, you know, I want to have more than one model out there for people to, to think about. So anyway, I have three models. One model is empathy, and that's the one that I published about before. And it's important to call it a model because it's, it's, it's actually an analogy with human empathy. It can't be whatever God does is not the same as human empathy. But human empathy does have some features that are worth mentioning um, that you know, get your intuitions going. Um, I think that in, in, the, in a situation of empathy, the empathizer uh, takes on in imagination the feeling of, of another person um, uh, imaginatively rep they represent the other person's feeling in their imagination. Um, so it's easy to, you know, people do this all the time with other people's feelings. If I have a friend who's grieving over the loss of her father, I, when I empathize, I sort of take on in my imagination the way her grief feels to her and to be able to understand how that, how, what it is, um, I will talk to her. I will know something about her, about her relationship with her father, how she feels about him. And, you know, to get some sense of what the loss is like for her. Um, now in human empathy, of course, the, the feeling that we represent and our imagination is never a perfect copy. But you can imagine that it could be a perfect copy. Mm -hmm. And for God, of course, it would be. But the harder problem, though, which makes this not a perfect model, is that um, in human empathy, there's two egos in which the, the ego of the empathizer is representing an imagination. The state of the person they're empathizing with. So there's a, a kind of a distance between the empathizer and the person they're empathizing with. Um, when you empathize, you always know who you are. And, you know, that one, okay, do we want, of course, we would want to say when God empathizes with us, God knows who he is and that he's not us. But there's something not quite satisfactory, I think, about the idea that empathy is representational. Um, 
on traditional views of God, God does not know by representing anything. You know, there's no, God knows directly, not indirectly. God doesn't have to sort of create some copy or representation of something. Um, it's supposed to be direct. Um, so if you like the idea or want to focus, push the idea that God's knowledge of everything has to be direct, that leads to a second model, the perceptual model. And um, there are many places, both in scripture and in uh, uh, philosophy, where people speak of God seeing us or seeing the creation. I mean, they don't actually think that God has eyes and has a visual faculty, but vision is our probably our best faculty, uh, best sensory faculty anyway. And so it's a natural um, uh, analogy for God's knowing to talk about vision. Um, and so the idea would be God sort of sees your empathy. I mean, excuse me, sees your feeling sees your pain, sees your, your suffering, sees your joy, sees whatever's going on in your mind right now. God sort of looks at it. So it's as if your mind or your, you know, your, your mind is this transparent ball and God sort of looks into it. But the trouble with that, it, it, both the empathy model and the perceptual model really only makes sense if there's a distinction between the subject and the object. So it still looks like God is treating you as an object. God is looking at your consciousness rather than sort of grasping it the way you do. The, the grasp might be close. You know, that's why I say it's sort of in your head, real close, you know, but real close is not the same as really being, experiencing it, as you do it, as you mm -hmm. do. So um, those two models um, create a problem um, simply because we might think that the whole point of subjectivity is that it's not an object. And so God's grasp of it cannot be a grasp of an object. It has to be a grasp of a subject. You know, God's grasping you, the subject, and your states. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's some that's a problem. Now, in the book that I'm writing, I am saying some things about the the fact that Aquinas says argues that for God, God does not know in a way in a way that distinguishes the subject from the object. God knows everything in Himself. Um, so the, the subject object distinction in knowing seems to be missing. Well, missing sounds like a negative word, you know, uh, does it is, is not present in God's knowing. And if you can make that work, then that could help the perceptual model and the empathy model that there, there has to be a way that the subject God as the subject and you as having a conscious state as an object is not actually an object. God, God grasps you as a subject. The third model is panentheism. And what I've said sort of naturally leads people to think of it, to think of that model. Um, suppose your mind is part of God. Um, suppose you are in God. Um, so that when you see, when you feel, God is sort of seeing through you or feeling through you. Um, there are lots of interesting examples of this in the history of philosophy. Uh, I, I'm really taken with the Hindu Upanishads. I've been reading these. I love them. There's a lot that expresses the idea I just said where Atman, the self, the one self, sort of is conscious through you. You know, yourself with a small s is, is an illusion. There's really only one self. Now, Westerners don't like the idea that there's only one self. Um, but it's 
it's interesting that some of the things you read in the Upanishads are not that different from Western panentheism, the idea that we are a part of God. Um, and in thinking about this recently, I don't, you know, I don't have this all worked out, but it seems to me that classical theists um, and panentheists say many of the same things. Um, it's just that there's a difference in the interpretation of the word in, you know, like if you say, um, uh, I am in God, well, what does the in mean? Um, Panentheus take it more literally than Aquinas. Aquinas says we are in God. Aquinas says that too, but he's thinking of it as an analogy. Um, and so it's, it's a, it's a, the word in is a spatial word. Mm-hmm. And no matter who you are, panentheist or classical theist, Aquinas or me or anybody, it's you probably don't really mean, you know, you're in God the way a cup is in the cupboard. You don't mean that. So the word in has to be examined anyway, no matter what view you have. And I just think that... Um, all these models that I've suggested, the empathy model, the perceptual model, the panentheist model, in a, in a way, they're not that different. They just give a different interpretation of how you would explain the sense in which God is in you when you're feeling or you are in God when you're feeling. The in is the issue. It can't be spatial, no matter who you are. I mean, you're not going to think that. So um, those, anyway, that's briefly what the models are. Right. Well, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep pressing forward, but we, okay. we'll get to some objections to, mm-hmm. uh, well, I guess omnisubject, omnisubjectivity in general, no matter how it works, but you laid out three models uh, that would allow God to be some omnisubjective, but there are very big differences in those models for sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. So can God have counterfactual omnisubject, omnisubjectivity? And what I mean by that, when I ask is uh, suppose, well, there, there are many people that God did not create. <laughs> he could have mm-hmm. created such people, but he did not create those people. Um, would God have knowledge of, the experiences they would have had, had he created them. Right. Now, you'll notice that the way I define omnisubjectivity at the beginning, it only applies to actual past, present, and future actual subjective states. Um, A natural question to ask is what you just said. What about subjective states? Well, it doesn't have to be for a being that was never created. It could be for you. Um, is there such a thing as, or does God know what it would have been like if you had gone to Antarctica last month? I assume you didn't and saw something. I don't know. You know, uh, you can ask lots and lots of questions. We all ask questions even of ourselves. What, what would it have been like if I'd taken another different career, married a different person, moved to a different state. You know, we we all think about these things. And we think that there must be something that it would have been like if I'd moved to a different state. As a matter of fact, I did move to a different state. But, um, and so if, you know, if there is something that it would have been like if I'd moved, say, to Hawaii instead of New Mexico, then we would think God would know that, right? God should be able to grasp it. Um, now it seems like the argument that a cognitively perfect being should know all possible subjective states, not just the actual ones. That seems like a pretty straightforward argument, but I'm actually not sure that I'm convinced by it. And the reason is that there's, I I gave a reason in my first omni subjectivity paper that there's something about subjectivity that ties it to the actual in a different way than propositions are. I mean, you could, we all think, look, 
there's no difference between the actual world and an, uh, another possible world in that both of them are exhaustively described by propositions. It's just that the true ones are a little different in one than another, you know? So it makes all, all possible worlds look like they're on a par, but one gets to be actual. And then you say, well, so what makes it actual? Like what happened? You know, like there's something going on um, that makes the proposition true. Something's happening. Um, so this has led me to, or did lead me anyway, to think about what is actuality? What, what's, what's in the actual world? Um, it seems like there should be more in the actual world than in other possible worlds. And so I, I toyed with the idea that there's no subjectivity except in the actual world. Um, that subjectivity is part of what makes the actual world actual. This is not an argument, it's just a hunch. And then I've gone back and forth, well, no, yes, no, you know. And I don't have any, I don't have a, an answer to this. Um, and I don't know what I will do in the book. I started uh, thinking about this chapter and I might just give arguments on both sides and just let people pick. <laughs> I don't know. So, well, yeah, that's helpful to think about it. What what are the advantages, disadvantages, drawbacks? Okay, let's go to the next one then, because I want to get to these questions soon. Oh, okay. Um, is omnisubjectivity in conflict with other attributes like timelessness and immutability and impassibility? Okay, so um, I don't. Uh, what I have thought in the past was that timelessness and immutability, um, th there's no additional problem um, uh, with timelessness and immutability that is generated by postulating that God is omnisubjective. There, there's already a problem in trying to explain how it could be that a timeless and immutable being can grasp a, um, um, chains of events that take up a period of time. So think of like a war or a football game. Um, there's a problem in, in explaining how God can um, grasp the progress of the football game if he's timeless. Now, there are people who think there's an answer to that. And what I want to say is whatever they say is the same answer I could give for omnisubjectivity. Maybe there's a conflict and maybe there's not. But I don't see that there's an additional problem for an omnisubjective God than for one that's not omnisubjective, but it's just timeless. So um, that's why I haven't thought about it a whole lot. Um, uh, and maybe I don't care about the outcome all that much. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, then there's the attribute of impassibility. Um, I, I mean, I've, I've been kind of, uh, well, I have said in some papers that it might turn out that omnisubjectivity is incompatible with impassibility. And then I just say, so what? That's okay. Um, but I, I'm not 100% sure that it really is incompatible. Um, again, I don't think about it all that much because it's not that important to me to defend impassibility. So if it turns out that it's incompatible with pass impassibility, well, then I guess that's the way it goes. Uh, but I think this is another thing where we really don't know if it's incompatible or not without having some account of what it is to be affected by something. So impassibility is supposed to be the property of not being affected by anything humans are doing or thinking or feeling, um, not being moved by anything. Um, outside of God. Um, well, I mean, what does it mean to be affected? Um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's I, I'm not sure what to say exactly, because there could be a kind of eternal um, uh, effectiveness, if that's the word, going on in God, but it's going on in God. I'm not sure what to say. I mean, it depends on how seriously you take Aquinas's idea that God knows everything in his own essence. It's not like he has to, you know, he's affected by something outside of him that wasn't already in his essence. I mean, I think he thinks it is already in his essence. So some of this just depends on these kind of rarefied debates about what God's essence is and just how God knows anything, not just subjective states, but how God knows anything. So that's kind of a, you know, quick, maybe, I hope it's not, I'm not being dismissive. I, I, I But the truth is I don't, find the objections. I don't, I don't think the outcome of the debate about whether omnisubjectivity is incompatible with these attributes is very important mm -hmm. to me. Anyway, it's not very important. Okay. We're getting close to uh, your, the time for questions. Um, so if you've got a question, go ahead and type it in the live chat. Just put the word question at the beginning. Did you want to ask about the moral objection? Was that your next one? Yes, yeah. that's okay. why I went ahead. This will be my last question, then we'll okay. go to the viewers' okay. question. So, um, okay. so, yeah, what's this objection? Okay, so the moral objection, really, I think, borrows from David Hume's idea that having an idea is just like having an impression. It's just weaker. So... Your idea, you have an, your idea of red is just like seeing red. It's just fainter. Your idea of pain is just like having a pain. It's just fainter. Your idea of feeling in a murderous rage is just like feeling in a murderous rage, only weaker. Um, so the idea here is, some of what God would be grasping and grasping human subjective states would corrupt him, or maybe not corrupt, but it would be completely um, incompatible with his moral perfection and holiness. So God can't, so the idea is if God really got what it's like to be this cruel person who enjoys torturing people, if he really got it, then in a sense, he would be enjoying torturing people. Because the idea of, of enjoying torturing people is real close to actually enjoying torturing people. They're, maybe they're not identical, but they are really close. So it sounds like God would somehow be contaminated by his creation. I think that's the moral objection. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. other. You summarize that well. Yeah, that's good enough, I guess. <laughs> and how do I respond? I, 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 well, I mean, I go back to what I've said in other work that, um, you know, when you, when you watch a movie that's depicting a really evil character, uh, and let's suppose the actor is really good at it, you can, you can get what it's like to feel like they feel, to feel enjoyment of cruelty, for example. Um, but that in no way makes you enjoy cruelty or makes it more likely you will go out and enjoy cruelty. I mean, it just, because your own ego is always with you. You always know who you are. And so when you are taking on the perspective of the character in the movie, you you are doing it in a way that separates the ego of the character from your own ego and the way and your own judgment you would make about the character. And so you can say the same thing about God. God could, you know, sort of get what you're going through and what it's like to be you and what it's like for the evil character to be or the evil person to be enjoying cruelty without in any way enjoying cruelty himself. Uh, having quite the opposite reaction, in fact. Um, that's about the best I can do with that. There's other things that could be said about whether 
an idea of a subjective state is very much like the subjective state. You know, how close is it? Um, that's a kind of empiricist uh, approach to the way, to the mind, but we can, I'll just leave that aside. Yeah, that will, well, this, I think this particular objection will, it might get redundant, but it's going to come out in the questions. I feel like this is the one that people sure, struggle yeah. with the most when it comes mm -hmm. to omnisubjectivity. So let me go ahead and pull a couple of questions that were submitted before the interview. Okay. One of them comes from uh, Ryan Mullins. I messaged him actually. I know that he's written a book, God and Emotion, yeah, yeah, and and written on this. So I was like, hey, what are a couple of your you know places you would push back? And and so this is what he says. Let me take down the uh, question so it's not in the way anymore. He says, Zebzebski says that omnisubjectivity entails passability because God suffers. She also says omnisubjectivity is compatible with timelessness and immutability and simplicity. I deny this. Here is why. God would be timelessly and unchangingly suffering. Given simplicity, God is identical to his suffering. Say God eliminates evil at the last judgment, all that jazz. I get to heaven and I am super excited. I walk up to God and say, how are you doing? God says, I am eternally locked into a state of suffering. What do you think? I ask God if there is anything I can do to change his suffering. He says, no, I am identical to my suffering. Can't change that. That just sounds completely wrong. Yeah. What do you think? Okay. So let me just start with the first sentence because, um, well, first of all, I'm not completely convinced that omnisubjectivity entails passability, although I have said it might. And if it does, that's OK with me. Um, but I don't say God suffers, I don't think. If I did, I didn't certainly didn't mean to. Um, I think God grasps your suffering the way you do. And I think that's the, the, the heart of the matter. How can God grasp suffering without suffering? How can God grasp a feeling of cruelty without feeling himself cruel? Um, so it's, it's the, the the problem of how God can be in your head without being you or how God can um, grasp you as a subject, not an object, as a subject without actually being you as you are going through your subjective experiences. Um, so I guess I want to... Um, I want to just stop at the first sentence. I don't think God suffers. Um, so is Ryan here? I mean, is, is he part of this conversation or how does this work? I don't see him in the live chat. So okay. I'm, I'm assuming okay. no. Okay. Okay. So I would, I mean, I do want to, you know, talk to him about this, correspond with him about it. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a, the, the, this is why I said none of the models are really, really hit the nail on the head. Um, I guess on the panentheist model, God does suffer. I mean, because God's suffering sort of through you. Um, and the perceptual model and the empathy model, no, I don't think so. Like when you're empathizing with your friend's grief, you're not actually grieving. I mean, you never met the father, right? I mean, you aren't grieving. Um, so you are not in the state that the person you're empathizing with is in. So the, in that sense, then, even though you are suffering, God is not suffering when he empathizes with your suffering. That's the way it should work out according to, you know, the way I'm trying to, you know, the way I'm trying to make it work out anyway. Okay. Uh, I think we're there four more questions. How are you on time? Like, do we need to cut off in five minutes? I can have a couple more minutes. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll squeeze in as many as we can. Dinner, so it's okay. So there's, yeah. there's another one from Ryan here. Okay. Uh, and he says this, David Anzalo, I assume, presented a paper on hell and omnisubjectivity. The damned in hell suffer eternal conscious torment if God is omnisubject 
omnisubjective, then God will be empathizing with this conscious torment for the rest of eternity. It is difficult to say that there are no tears in heaven when God is suffering empathetically with the damned. That is really good. I like this. I don't know about this paper. Um, yeah. So there's a number of ways one could respond to this. One way would be to say, well, then I guess the damned, there are no damned suffering eternally in hell. So that God doesn't have to do this. Um, yeah. I don't know what to say about that because I guess I'm inclined to think there isn't an eternal hell. Um, and then, but that's for different reasons. And, you know, so um, suppose there is, then wouldn't this be a problem for omnisubjectivity? And I don't know what to say about that because in a sense, even if we're not talking about hell, there's still the, the, the issue that Ryan brought up in the previous question that, you know, you'd think that God's consciousness is eternal consciousness. So if God is conscious of even one pain, it would seem like God is eternally conscious of that pain. And if God is, is conscious of all the pain there ever was, then God is eternally conscious of all that pain. It doesn't matter if people are suffering eternally in hell. Um, because the eternity isn't necessarily in the victim or not the victim, you know, the creature, the eternity is in God's own consciousness. So it would seem like God would be eternally um, uh, conscious of suffering. And um, am I, do I disagree with that? No, that might be all right. I don't, as I said before, though, I don't think that's the same thing as saying God is eternally suffering, but God could be eternally conscious of suffering. That's possible. Okay. I'm going to squeeze in a couple more if, if okay. possible here. So we've got one from Zach Raymer. He said, yeah. one value of the incarnation is Christ's empathy with our suffering, according to Hebrews 2.18 and 4.15. An omnisubjective God would know what it is like to suffer or be tempted without incarnating. Incarnation seems less valuable or even unnecessary for an omnisubjective God. What do you think about yeah, that? That's a really good question. Um, I can't remember if I've... Um, responded to this in previous papers. I have thought about it in previous papers. Um, what I have been inclined to think is that the incarnation was not necessary in order that Christ could empathize with our suffering. That's not why it was necessary. Um, because as Zach points out, an omnisubjective God already knew what it was like to suffer and empathized with our or, or empathized with suffering. Um, but there are lots of reasons why there would be an incarnation for an omnisubjective God. And there's one thing I thought of that an omnisubjective God would not get without being incarnated. And that is what it is like to be a particular human person. So um, let's see how I, can I say this? God would always know what it's like to be human creatures in this empathic way. But unless God is actually incarnated as one of them, God would never have the experience of being a unique human being, unlike any other, with a unique history, um, with a unique set of subjective states that makes that person different from every other. And so that would be one thing that, um, one thing that the incarnation could give to an omnisubjective God. Of course, there's other things too that everybody, you know, that's well known in, in theology. But this is a particular one that I think um, is important. And then 
if you think of the Trinity as omnisubjective of each other, each person of the Trinity is omnisubjective of each other, then anything that Jesus experiences as human is then grasped by the other members of the Trinity. Okay. Well, um, let's see. At least one more we may squeeze if you're okay with it. One okay, more. okay, sure. All right, so my friend... Uh, Chris Tweet, he's oh, a professor yeah. of philosophy out in Virginia. Mm -hmm. He asked, does God know what it's like to sin or to blaspheme God? Okay, so um, roughly, I guess the answer is yes, but it a lot hinges on what on the, the term what it's like. So, um, you know, Tom Nagel put a lot of emphasis on that whole idea of what it's like to be a bat. Um, and in Frank Jackson's story about Mary, there was an emphasis on what it's like to see color. And the expression what it's like, I think is just an informal way to call attention to the fact that the way an experience is to a subject is different than the way that experience is treated as an object by somebody who's judging it or looking at it from the outside. So I do want to say that God would know what it's like for to be a subject who chooses to sin, who's cruel, who blasphemes, and so on. So I think the answer is yes. But the, then I just have to go back to what I've said before about problems and explaining what that means, because I want to insist that knowing what it's like to blaspheme is not the same as blaspheming. Knowing what it's like to sin is not the same as sinning. Knowing what it's like to grieve is not the same as grieving and so on. So that's why so much emphasis, so much focus has to be on the models of how this works because even though I think omnisubjectivity is a fabulous attribute and it seems to me it's necessary as, a, as an attribute of God, it can't be necessary if it's impossible. <laughs> and so we need models that would give us ways of thinking about it that would show how it's possible. Models help us stretch our conceptual resources. Models are always the models I've talked about. I said they're all analogies. They're all they're they can't be taken literally. They're just meant to to show us to point the way to conceptual possibilities, but they don't really give us an actual metaphysical account of how omnisubjectivity would work. Okay, this will be the last question, I promise. This okay. one comes from Parker over at Parker's Pensies. And you actually did an interview with Parker. Yes, I did. Recently. Yeah. And after, when he posted that interview on Facebook, there were a few people that asked about this and Parker himself asked. So I want to get it in now. He says, <clears throat> um, ask whether or not there's a regress problem. Uh, ad intra. The father knows the son's knowing the spirit's first person perspective. Yeah, right. But the spirit knows the father's knowing the son's mm -hmm. knowing of the spirit's first person perspective, etc. Ad infinitum. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I need to think about this more, but uh, I do have a couple reactions. One is suppose there is an infinite regress. Is that a problem? I mean, God is an infinite mind, so God can grasp the infinite regress. Uh, the Father can grasp the infinite regress. The Son can grasp the infinite re infinite regress. There, so one one response would be, well, maybe, but that's all right. Um, but another response would require thinking more than I have about whether each act, each grasp is a distinct act. You know, the father grasping the son, 
this father grasping the son's grasp of the father's grasp of the son's grasp of the father is each one a distinct grasp that generates the regress or should we think a little bit more as Aquinas does that all of God's grasping is one there's only one act um this is so abstruse I really don't know how far you know I can go with that but um it is at least something that might be worth thinking about maybe I should be thinking about anyway well I've enjoyed this interview so much thank you for taking Good. even extra time with me well thank you so much and thank you to all the people who sent questions if there's more I'd like to I'd like to see them you know uh that is that is it uh I think maybe uh I'll I'll put this one on the screen you, you might have one off the top of your head memorized uh so Tim, let's see. Well, I did, yeah, but I mean, people could send them questions. Oh, to okay, me sure, 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 yeah. Or and I'd like to see what they are, you know, because I'm writing this book. So yeah, yeah. Well, let's just do that. People can email you and yeah, uh, and see what you think. Okay, thank you again, uh, well, Doctor. So yeah, much. really enjoyed it. Thank and you. Thank everybody. you, the viewer, for watching. Um, we'll see you next. Uh, see you later.